the USO knows that one of the most beautiful things about the military community is that we're a fabric of all different walks of life, of different people, nationalities, family makeups, priorities. It's one of the reasons why we're worth celebrating. Um, and they know that what keeps us up at night is also worth worrying about. And that's one of the reasons we're so excited about the attention the White House has given the issue of military spouse employment. And so I'm proud to um, now ask you to watch a video from the Second Lady of the United States, Mrs. Karen Pence. Hello. I wish I could be there in person with you all at this year's summit, the salute to military spouses. It sounds like you're covering a lot of ground today. The summit addresses key issues military spouses face, such as education and employment, community building, peer networking, and family resiliency. And this is great. You know, military families are near and dear to my heart. My son is a Marine. I'm the daughter of an Air Force Airman and the daughter-in-law of a U.S. Army veteran who fought in Korea. I know without a doubt that the strength of our nation not only comes from those who wear the uniform and protect us every day, but from the spouses and the children who serve alongside our service members and make great sacrifices to protect this country. I recently launched a campaign to elevate, encourage, and thank our military spouses. Military life is not easy. I've heard so many stories about the difficulties of being hired and the inconsistent licensing requirements from state to state, childcare, and so much more. I'm so glad that the USO is shining a spotlight on how we can all come together as one unified community and extended family to support military spouses, which is critical to military readiness and national defense. I know that the panels earlier today discussed some of the issues that the military spouse community faces, such as employment and financial stability, but there are many more factors that strengthen and empower military spouses. We must also address the critical challenges many military spouses face in establishing and maintaining an identity and a sense of purpose. In addition to creating strong individuals, it is vitally important to connect military spouses with trusted networks and support systems. In the next panel, called Voices of the Military Spouse, we will hear directly from military spouses who will share their experiences candidly and lead a transparent discussion on overcoming challenges, shattering perceptions, finding or creating sources of strength, and much, much more. I hope you gain new insight and knowledge from the panel discussion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Deputy Director and Special Assistant to the President at the White House, Jenny Korn. Thank you so much. It is an amazing day, and it's such an honor to be here, and I thank the USO uh, for inviting me and my fellow panel um, to be here. Uh, my name is Jenny Korn, as the voice of God said, a special assistant <laughs> to the president and uh, deputy director of the Office of Public Liaison, and our job at the White House is to make sure that we're engaging with real Americans all across the country and making sure that their voices are heard um, on the policy and legislation that we passed. Uh, and one of the most proud things I have done, especially aside from all the veterans, um, improvements that we've made is to pass the executive order on military spouse unemployment and hiring uh, across the federal government. And uh, my story uh, reflects why I was so excited um, to be a part of that. Um, I'm a Marine Corps spouse. My husband served 21 years uh, in the Marine Corps. And uh, when I started my career, uh, I was uh, running state uh, and assembly races in California. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it to the big times. And then I, I met my husband, who by the way, was in the Army first and did a lateral move into the Marine Corps. And I heard all these horror stories about, oh, the Marine Corps, he's going to change when he goes to boot camp and all this stuff. He's always going to be gone. And so I said, you know, I heard that they deploy a lot. Again, I'm very young. I'm 19 years old. And he goes, they don't go on deployments very often. I mean, really? 
<laughs> right? I see you do this, right? Oh my God, I learn every year and a half they go on deployments for six months at least. Uh, so that became our journey and uh, I, like probably all of you, was where do I find work in my field, in the career that I had already been on this, on this path for a couple years. And I would drive an hour and a half just to be on a campaign. Um, I would be at one, in one way, um, working 14 hour days just to stay in my field. Um, and then just like every, uh, other wives, I said, I can't do this anymore. I wanna spend some more time with my husband. So I, I got my teaching credential and taught on Camp Pendleton for a little while and took time off of my career. Um, then went back and forth and back and forth uh, with that story. Then I got this amazing opportunity uh, to work for President Bush back in 2003. And uh, I competed with 30 other people in Washington, D.C., and we were living in California at the time. And uh, I, I remember getting the job and being so excited and then going, oh yeah, what are we gonna do with my husband? Like, where's he gonna go? <laughs> How are we gonna do this? So I asked for a letter um, from the campaign basically saying that I was working for the president and could there be a possibility of my husband being transferred somewhere, at least on the East Coast, so we could see each other once in a while. Um, well, six months into it, uh, they said, yes, we're gonna send you to Quantico. Uh, three years, non-deployable, and I was like, oh my God, that's the most amazing thing. But you know that didn't happen, right? <laughs> six months in, so he did, so we were apart six months, he, he uh, flew out, was at Quantico for six months, and he comes home one day with a bottle of wine, um, flowers, I'm not done yet, and a piece of jewelry. And I thought, oh my God, this is really bad. It wasn't my birthday <laughs> and it wasn't my anniversary. And we had already developed a system at that point um, because he used to just come in, I'm sure you guys have experienced this, blurted, oh, I gotta go to Guam tomorrow or I gotta go wherever to, tomorrow. And you're like, okay, great, yeah, I'll see ya. So I was like, I need a buffer. I need like a shock absorber before you give me uh, bad news. And so he did, he's like, I have bad news. Had all these things with him, and I said, all right, from one to 10, it's like 12. Oh, man. So he said he was getting, basically take, getting taken from Quantico, going down to Lejeune for three years, but really to do back-to-back -back deployments. Um, but what uh, I neglected to, to tell you was that I had just got a job. I was on the campaign. I had just been a job, offered a job at the White House. That, from a little girl from East LA, um, working on city council races and state assembly races to be able to work at the White House was a dream. And I thought, what do I do? Do I go down to Lejeune and be with my husband, knowing that I have no family, no friends, no job, um, just to spend a little bit of time with him in between deployments, or do I stay here and go, you know, go forward with my career? We prayed a lot about it and thought, it was best for me to stay with the with a job knowing he was just gonna be going um, back and forth so much. So for three years we did the Geo Bachelor, which was very difficult. Um, I was, I think, the only military spouse in the White House whose husband was in combat at the time I was working. Uh, so it was very difficult, but a very supportive, uh, supportive system. Um, but it just goes to show you, I would have never thought that I would even get to the White House, but still trying to be in that military lifestyle, and we either give up a little bit of our, our lives with our family, or we either give up a little bit of those lives in our careers. Um, but now, I'm back the second time at the White House, I would have never thought that would have happened. And so while we go through the bumps in the road, there's always the way to recreate ourselves. There's always a way to come back. And I just know that as military spouses here in the room, you are resilient. You're an amazing group of people. These are an amazing group of people. Um, but that, that's just a little bit of my story. And I want to now turn to these amazing people that I'm with. And I know that you have already seen the research um, from what has been done earlier today uh, and the findings that while we have different experiences in our military life, um, we all have a common, theme, common themes that go throughout all of our lives. And so I want to introduce real quickly to you today, we have Tessa Robinson. She's a Navy wife, writer, speaker, and crisis management consultant and has just a myriad of experience that she'll talk about. Brian Alvarado, a 2018 Navy military spouse of the year. And Lauren Klempel, an Air Force wife, mother, advocate, and volunteer. Our group is gonna go ahead and share those three different themes of identity and sense of purpose, trusted networks and support systems, 
and agency and ability to plan because they have been very prominent in all of our journeys. And when we got on the phone um, earlier, uh, like this month, we thought we have a little bit of all of those things. We want you to hear directly from these military spouses and discuss their personal path and how we can all relate to each other. So Tessa, why don't we start with you? Uh, we heard that mili military spouses cited a lack of control over their own lives and ability to plan for the future. I'm not even gonna ask you if that's something you've experienced because I know that you have. <laughs> Could you please tell us about your Absolutely. experience? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and for being here. It's, it's an honor to be on this stage with so many fantastic other military spouses. Um, I saw a meme the other day of good old Austin Powers, the international man of mystery that said, oh, I see you bought plane tickets before your leave was approved. I too <laughs> like to live dangerously. <laughs> and it made me think, you know, it made me laugh. And I think we all have those stories of, you know, a last minute TDY that comes up and so our trip home was canceled or the, you know, unexpected workup or the unexpected deployment. Um, we all have those, of parties canceled and things like that. For me, the unpredictability, I'm married to a Navy helicopter pilot. And so we don't find out my husband's schedule until the night before every single day. Um, and because of that, the implications for me has been much broader. Um, in fact, yesterday, after almost 13 years with the federal government, that unpredictability is what led me to resign. Um, not having the ability to plan for childcare or not having the ability to know when I have something scheduled that my husband's gonna be there, we have the reliability of family. Because who actually lives by their parents when they're in the military? None of us. Um, so for me, the, the implications of the unpredictability has been very, very difficult. And then how about with your with overseas? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that experience? So when we first got married, uh, my husband came home and he, with flowers and said, guess where we're going? And I thought it was going to be like Vegas or something awesome. Um, and it was awesome, but it was Guam. And for those of you who don't know, that is a small little island very, very far away. And I went to the bookstore and I sat down and I opened the only book I could find about Micronesia. And the first sentence said, Guam can be explored in about a day or two. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so to get there for a three year tour um, was, was pretty exciting. Uh, but we, we did, we drove around the entire island in three hours. And then my husband came home with flowers and said, I'm deploying in two weeks. And so for me, having quit my job, and I mean, I know Brian will speak to the identity piece and Lauren will as well. Um, but to go from this also working at the White House to this spouse in Guam with nothing and then my husband's leaving for the better part of 15 months deployment, um, gosh, that was, that was so hard. And you don't know what you're getting into, at least I didn't. I married a guy that I sat next to in biology in high school and ran into in a bar eight years later. I had no <laughs> idea that this is what our life would look like. Um, so the unpredictability, especially overseas with the challenge of flights and cost, um, and not knowing what you're gonna do after you see the whole island in three hours is really challenging. And I think that's why this research is so important and really supports what all of us are, are talking about today, um, that we do need some concrete planning in our lives and you have to make the best of it. I always tell my mom, because I was really young when I met my husband, that I met him at a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's about 10 late years later I got caught and I was like, Oh, well, the first part of that word was correct. So. <laughs> All right, we'll turn to Brian. Brian, we um, talk about trusted uh, networks and support systems and how that affects us, how it can be negatively affecting us as we move around um, to in our in our professional lives and our personal lives. I know that you have an amazing story as um, military spouse of the year, very cool. Uh, and so could you share that story with us? Absolutely. I. Um I came into the military community uh, with um, a lot of fear, uh, and uh, a lot of that fear was self-inflicted, uh, but it was, it, it was there and it was very real. Um, I am uh, a 39-year-old male military spouse in a same-sex interracial marriage. So I'm just about the weirdest military spouse <laughs> in the world. Um, <clears throat> and so I, uh, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to turn to uh, when, uh, we decided to get married, uh, but uh, the internet is a great thing uh, if you use it wisely. Um, <laughs> I was able to uh, find an organization called the American Military Partners Association, and they are an organization that advocates and educates for LGBT military spouses, um, partners, and uh, I found my very first tribe, and uh, I will never forget the kindness and compassion that they showed 
for me and educated me uh, to the point where I actually started to lift my head up when I would walk into a commissary instead of keeping my eyes down because I was so scared. Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention um, about us and all of the diversity that we um, carry with us is that we don't have to just have one tribe, right? We can be interested in multiple different things. We are multifaceted uh, uh, type of people. And so another piece of my life is uh, I've, I've always been career minded and I have a successful business and uh, it's something I'm very proud of and that I, I hold dear to my heart. And so. Uh, when I found out about the organization Hiring Our Heroes and its Military Spouse Professional Network, I clung to those people because I can talk to them about the challenges that we face as military spouses and employment space, but we can also mentor um, and help uh, the next generation of military spouses that are in, in our shoes. And so that's one thing I really wanted to just kind of touch on and, and let everybody know that you don't have to be pigeonholed. Uh, into one thing. You can be multiple things. You could have multiple different um, networks uh, of people that you trust. And with the power of the internet and, and the way that uh, groups work and, and whatnot on Facebook, you can keep in touch with these people after you've established that relationship. Um, there are people in this room and watching at home that I've only met two or three times, but they are some of the most dear people to me because I could pick up the phone at any time and call you guys. They love you for that. So hold on to that. That's awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, yes, you can clap. Yeah. <laughs> We're all here for you. I know. It can, be, it can be very lonely being a military spouse sometimes, even if you live on the base because of just what you're going through. So um, that brings us to Lauren. Um, the self, self uh, identity and self of purpose. I think a lot of us struggle with that as we go through our careers and we go through our lives. And now you have a special story about how you came into um, the military. I think uh, you didn't grow into the military like some of us did, but you came in after your husband had already been in for a while. So why don't you talk about your experience a little bit and also like how your self uh, sense of purpose has become as a mother, as a, as a spouse, and an advocate. Okay, thank you so sure. much. Um, our story is definitely different. Um, my husband and I met, we got married, we had a baby, we both had amazing jobs, living our life, everything was quote unquote normal. Um, and all of a sudden, I'll never forget the day, my husband walked in uh, and said, honey, I have a great idea. <laughs> And I, that all, that's always scary. We know that's always scary. And he said, I want to join the Air Force. Okay. <laughs> uh, I really wasn't sure how to respond. Let me also add that at the time he was 315 pounds. So I said, okay, go for it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you do that. <laughs> Uh, so he walked into a recruiter's office and the recruiter said exactly what we're all thinking. Okay, bud, you know, that's fine. Uh, come back and see me when you lose the weight. Six months later, almost to the day, my husband had lost 120 pounds and was in that same recruiter's office signing our lives away. No. <laughs> no. Um, so I wasn't really sure. I, I knew I... We were always big supporters of the military, but I had no clue what we were getting into, no idea. Here I was, this mom, I was a working mom. I was in a job where I made almost $100,000 a year, working very comfortably, living very comfortably. And he said, and on top of everything else, I want you to quit your job. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> um, I, so I did. I did. I found out I was pregnant with our son. He uh, left while I was pregnant. I ended up having our son while he was in basic training. So here I was at home, two kids, getting ready to find out where we were going to be stationed and had no clue, no idea what we were getting into. Um, I, we found out we were going to Langley in Virginia. and. I was not happy at all. I had never been to Virginia, and that could have been a foreign country to me. I knew nothing about Virginia. My husband's a huge history buff. I am not at all. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but 
he he wanted to go and he was so excited and I said, okay, great. We're gonna pack up these kids or go to Virginia. We get to Virginia, what happens? Deployment, of course. And so here I am, brand new spouse, and I said, I have to make friends. I wanna go out and I wanna make friends because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was doing. Here I was, this working mom, traveling all the time, having my own sense of purpose, and all of a sudden it was ripped away to follow him across the country. And I really struggled. I think, we, you know, we all struggle. We all have our own experiences. And um, I really had a hard time with it. And I got there and I went to my first spouse event. And sometimes, I mean, we all know it can be very scary, but it can be very exciting. And I walked in and the very first question someone asked me was, what's your husband's rank? So I was so upset. I left in tears. I went home. My husband said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go talk to her. I'm going to make an appointment and I'm going to go talk to her. And he said, no, that's not a good idea. And I said, no, I am. And I did. I, I actually, uh, I met with her and I told her, I said, listen, I'm a brand new military spouse. I don't know anything. We can't treat people like that. Let's make a difference. Let's spread love, not hate. You know, we, we have to show new military spouses how to be military spouses. And so through that, it helped me kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And I do want to uh, be that mentor, you know, for these young spouses that are coming in that don't know anything. I have um, a spouse that just came to me last week and said, I just found out I'm pregnant and I have all these things happening and I should probably go to the doctor. And I said, no, all of those are normal. And she was like, but you don't understand. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. I've had three. I get it. Um, but through that, and, and I have to say um, a big thank you to Brittany Bacher. I know you're here somewhere. I'm not sure where you're at. But um, I uh, just want to say thank you to her because when I met her, I'm, we moved to Little Rock. We're currently stationed in Little Rock. And when I met her, um, the, she came up to me and she said, who are you? And I said, oh, hi, I'm Lauren and I'm a military spouse and I have three kids. And she said, no, no, no. Who are you? Hi, my name's Lauren, and I'm... <laughs> so I really wasn't sure what she was asking for. And through talking with her and, and through experiences, I've been blessed with some of the most amazing experiences and have really been able to come out of my shell and learn a lot. And, and I think that's important is, is trying to find yourself. And um, I was blessed to be part of the MSOI community this year um, as the Osan Air Base Military Spouse of the Year. Um, I have just, like I said, been blessed with some amazing opportunities, and I think um, we all have to work together. I think that's the biggest part is, is we have to help each other find ourselves. Yeah. That's, that's great, Lauren. I think um, one of the things that struck me, what you just said, is we need to be, especially those of us who've been in the military now for a long time, or military spouses, um, be mentors to those that are younger um, because they don't know what's coming up. I do remember one of the first... Um, uh, wives events that I went to before our husbands went on the first deployment and they were all older spouses and they were talking telling really horror stories and I came home crying to my husband going are you gonna be like this in 10 years you know it's so like oh my god um, and we've been married 20 so I think we're good uh, but being a mentor is is very important and um, Karen Kelly who's married to uh, Chief Kelly the chief of staff at the White House um, who's four-star general and also gold star family um, she talks she gives a great talk about being a mentor and making sure that we're taking care of those younger spouses uh, coming up. So I think that's important. Um, so one of the questions I think, and this is, I think it's good because if we're all spouses here, but we're also trying to teach non-spouses and non-military, like what is it to be in the military? What is it to be a military spouse? What would you like civilians to know what a military spouse is? Tessa, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love starting. Um, I think it's everything that we saw in this in this research that we're a diverse population. I mean, even just the three of us with Air Force and Brian being Brian, and um, <laughs> we're all, <laughs> but we are all so different, and we're all we're, we all have these unique experiences. And I think it's important for the civilian popul population to know that. I think more than anything, what I want people to know is that 
in order to support our troops, you have to also support their families. And there's no better way to support their families than by taking a chance and hiring a military spouse and giving them real, meaningful opportunities, uh, not at $12 an hour, um, but meaningful work because we are underemployed. We're three times less likely to have a job than our civilian counterparts. So put your money where your mouth is, civilians, and hire a military spouse. I, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's yeah, good. thank you. <laughs> Well, it was, so, it was so interesting to me when I got into some of the numbers. 16% unemployment among military spouses, but this is the number that struck me, 33% underemployment military spouses. And it, it's funny because non-military people ask me, why is that? So, well, because we're moving around so much and then we've got to prove ourselves every time. Uh, and I, the argument to me is, you know, millennials change jobs like every 18 months. We could be in one spot for two to three years, so we are actually the the smarter bet a little bit. <laughs> um, but I think that that it's unraveling sort of like stereotypes. Um, what would what would you say to that, Lauren? What would you like um, civilians to know about us? Honestly, just to piggyback off of that, I think um, she really hit the nail on the head with as far as the um, unemployment and the underemployment. I think a lot of times, you know. You, employers say they can't judge you based on race or gender or these things, but they can judge us based on the fact that we're military spouses. And it's just, I, I hate to be cliche and say it's not fair, you know, but it's not. It's not fair. And I think, unfortunately, it's a huge struggle. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it definitely is. And, and I work uh, deeply in this space in San Diego. And uh, for me, what I, what, I, what I want our civilian um, population to do is to... Uh, uh, break down their own stereotypes of what military spouses are mm -hmm. and uh, see us for who we really are and the talents that we bring to the table. And uh, we do that through educating them. Right. And uh, with the, a lot in part to what the White House is doing and Jenny uh, uh, personally uh, is uh, creating a nationwide conversation about this particular topic uh, over the last couple of years. And employers are stepping up and they're, they're coming to the table and they're saying, how can we help? We're sorry that it took this long. Um, so uh, we're, we're going in the right direction. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And so just for reference too, veterans had a 16% unemployment rate about 10 years ago. And then the government, the nonprofit, and the private sector all came together. And it was a media, it was PR, it was putting programs in place. And thank you to all the corporate sponsors that do that. Um, and now it's at 3.7% under the actual uh, unemployment rate, which is amazing for our veterans. So our goal is now, all right, now we've got that same 16%. We've got to put the government together with the private sector, and then how do we get our military spouse unemployment down to that 3.7%? I truly believe we, we can get there, but a lot of it is just saying that the problem exists and then who, you know, who we are. Um, when we signed the executive order, um, and what it does is basically puts a focus so that the federal government could hire um, military spouses, that there's now a focus so that when you apply um, for jobs wherever you are, that it will be a little bit easier for me, for you, it won't be a deterrent that you're a military spouse to, to apply. Um, and so in a year, we're gonna be able to see uh, how we're doing, and so hopefully we'll do, we'll do well. Um, but, what we said is we needed to, the federal government needed to step up before we asked the private sector to do the same thing, but through Hiring Heroes and all these other programs, we're seeing a lot of the private sector really step up and, and hire our military spouses, which is great. But when we had that signing ceremony, what I was gonna tell you was, I, I don't do a lot on Twitter, but I decided it was an exciting thing, so I, I put it on Twitter thinking, this is, who could be against this? This is hiring for military spouses. <laughs> and mostly positive, but um, Ivanka retweeted me, and so I got a lot of the uh, sort of negativity sometimes. Um, but some of them said, uh, why do we need to have a, a welfare program for military spouses? And I was like, whoa, um, wait, aren't you guys already taken care of? They take care of your, your food, your housing, your everything. And I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> yes, the big sergeant pay that we used to get <laughs> back in the day, right? Um, and just, but like, I thought, wow, we really, we have some work to do on our side to define what a military spouse is, introduce ourselves to everybody else and say, this is why we need, we need help. So now this is one, of, this is a great question. I like this. Um, as a new military spouse, and Lauren, we're going to start with you first. Um, were there any mistakes you made early on that made you laugh, that made us, or to make us laugh now? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, when I had our youngest daughter, my husband, of course, was off working, and 
I, uh, I remember I was in the hospital and the fur shirt walked in and this guy walked in behind him and he kept going out in the hall and using the phone and I said, this guy's so rude. And I was like, that's so rude to go out in the, and use the, you know, use the phone over and over again. And um, he, turns out he was the commander. <laughs> um, so when I saw him again, I was so nervous because my husband had told me, make sure you make a good impression. This is really important. You have to make a great impression on the commander. So I, you know, I'm walking up kind of just shaking and he kind of puts his hand like this. And I said, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. So I grabbed his hand and just kind of <laughs> did this earthy bow and stared straight at the floor going, you are ridiculous. And um, stood there for a while before I knew what, so then I jumped up and he goes, Okay, and <laughs> turned around and walked away. <laughs> so uh, don't ever bow to the commanders. <laughs> they are real people. <laughs> um, uh, but it ended up it ended up being a great experience and a great story to share. Oh, so that's awesome, Brian. Do you want to try to top that? So, <laughs> so mine isn't isn't a mistake I made. Uh, it was a mistake that happened to me. Um, I, um, uh, you know the story. Um, <laughs> when we got married, uh, I uh, uh, stopped my uh, private insurance and signed up for Tricare. And I, um, uh, d you know, I just did whatever. It was signed the papers, and they, you know, gave me a primary care physician. And uh, a little while later, several months, I got a really bad sinus infection. Uh, and so I said, I need to go see the doctor and get something for it. So I looked up who my primary care physician was and the address, and I went there. And turns out, uh, the TRICARE assigned me to an OBGYN. <laughs> um, so that wasn't going to work out. Um, so I called, and I said, there's been some sort of mistake. Uh, Brian, not Brianna, Brian. Um, and so they were like, oh, they were, they were mortified, right? They were just mortified. And they were like, okay, we'll, we'll assign you a new one at the Balboa Clinic. You know, you'll be all fine. Okay. So uh, some time had passed, and I needed to get a physical for uh, an adoption. We're going through an adoption process. And so I made an appointment uh, at this clinic uh, and showed up, and my primary care physician was an OBGYN. <laughs> So at this point, I, was, I called TRICARE and I just said, look, I appreciate everything that you do for military families, but I just don't have those parts. <laughs> so we're gonna have to do something different about this. Um, so that was my introduction into the military community. Um, and you know, standing up for being a male military spouse. I do now have the correct doctor. Uh, so everything's good. Thank goodness. Uh, but yeah. Yes, thank goodness. <laughs> All right, Tessa. These are hard to talk. I know. So I have, I have two very quick stories. The first one, um, when so we get to Guam, my husband deploys right away, and I met all the people on the island, which will shock all of you who know me as a total extrovert. Um, but when my husband got back, we got invited to this party at this guy and his wife's house. And so we went, and I introduced my husband to everybody, and I was like, oh, have you met Phil? Phil's great. you got to meet Phil. And so my husband's there talking to Phil. They have this nice conversation. He says, bye, Phil. Great to meet you. We're walking home. He said, hey, who's Phil? I said, oh, that's the base general. He's like, oh, my god. <laughs> <laughs> I called him Phil. Well, that's me. <laughs> so that one. Um, but I will say for my, I guess, my serious mistake that I made, uh, when Chris and I got married, I felt like I wasn't that military spouse. I had a career in the White House, I had a master's degree, I just graduated from the Harvard program. Um, I felt like that wasn't, that wasn't me, I wasn't a traditional military spouse. And this woman emailed me, uh, we were in San Diego, she was getting ready to move back to Guam, and she wanted to have coffee. And she said, I'd love to introduce you to the island before you get there. And I emailed her back and was like, oh, thank you, I'm very busy, I have a job, all these things. Um, and fortunately, when we got to Guam, her front yard was my backyard. And two weeks later, when my husband deployed for the better part of 15 months, that woman is the woman who came to my door, who brought coffee, who brought wine, who became my very best friend. And so for me, the ultimate mistake I made as a new military spouse was not embracing this community, thinking that I had a big old chip on my shoulder and not recognizing the power of finding either your whole tribe or just your Jolene. And that was my friend Jolene. 
Wow, thank you for sharing that. I, it just, all your funny stories just brought to mind. This was as my husband was going through his second boot camp, the Marine, boot, Marine Corps boot camp. And uh, I didn't experience the first boot camp army because that, he did that before we met. Um, and I was writing him letters and I thought, oh my God, I'm not getting any letters back. I thought it was over. You know, I didn't realize that they <laughs> don't let them write letters in boot camp until they write that one stupid green postcard that they put their name on and you, there's no love, there's no heart, there's no nothing, it just said, Jonathan, and I was like, oh my God. I was like, I, this, it is over. So then, I, <laughs> so I said, you know what? Maybe he's not getting my letters. So I was working um, for a company then who let me use their FedEx. So I started sending my letters FedEx. <laughs> so the drill sergeant had to get signed for the letters going to my husband. <laughs> so he didn't get to write me until after I had at least sent three FedEx packages. Um, and he sends this letter. It's like, thank you so much for sending the letters, but please stop sending me any letters. What I found out is every time he got one of those letters, he had to be in like the sandlot and do, please, son God, don't send me any more FedEx packages. Please, son God, don't send me any more. So I only sent one more FedEx package after that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that comes to the, to the end of our, um, our time here. But if there's any uh, ending thoughts that you guys would like to just share with the audience, Tessa, we just go down the, down the line? I think, I, again, it's such an honor to be here. Um, but I think really reading the study and digging into the research and widely sharing that with the people who aren't in this room, um, who who need to hear that there are these different personas, that there are these different struggles, and especially the people who have the power to impact change. Lauren? I think the biggest thing to remember is just because we're different doesn't mean we're not alike. I mean, we all have similar stories. We all, you know, go through the same struggles. We go through a lot of the same struggles. And I think it's just important to remember not to judge somebody just because they're you know, going through something because you never know if in six months you're gonna be going through the same thing. And I think that's, that's really important. I say this all the time, but it is the honor of my life to be a military spouse. And I just uh, wanna thank our community for embracing me and uh, making me a part of your tribe and uh, allowing me to uh, live this wonderful life with you. Great. And I think that I just want to, I love this sign right here. I want to thank the USO for saluting military spouses. So thank you so much. Thank you for letting us take time with you. Thank you.